Well, good morning. Good morning. It is great to be with you this morning. How many of you stayed up way later than you wanted to? Watching that Blue Jackets double overtime comeback, huh? Man, exciting. Now, easy, don't clap for the Jackets if you're not going to clap for Jesus. We're in church. <laughs> the one person, whoever it was, is like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm kidding. It was great. How exciting was that? Always fun when our city wins at anything, isn't it? It's good. We should be for our city. And we are, not just in sports, but in the gospel and in all ways that matter. We're going to start a series today as we open, entitled Made to Last. We're going to talk about uh, a lot of things as we go through the next several weeks, made to last relationships on Mother's Day, made to last families. We're going to talk about made to last resources and made to last legacy. On Memorial Day, the, when I'll talk about legacy, I'll have a World War II veteran with us. As many of you know him, Claire Parsons. Do you guys remember when Claire was with us last time on the stage? If you don't, uh, if you do remember, then you know that you'll want to be here. If you don't and weren't here, Take somebody else's word for it. You'll want, to, you'll want to be a part of that. So, You know, it seems like we live in a culture and in a time where most everything is disposable and replaceable. Right? We, we don't really have things that are made to, to go the distance anymore. We don't really have things that are intended to have great longevity. Matter of fact, uh, how many of you had a phone like this growing up? How many of you have never used a phone like this? For real, how many have never used a phone like this, right? Man, I'm, I'm super old. You know, if you wanted to call somebody, this is how it went. You would, you would dial, if it's a long distance, one, and then, you know, like seven. And if you're really in a hurry and there was somebody breaking into your house, you would do it like this. You'd try to rush it back, right? And this would be super mobile as far as a cord would stretch. And then you would take it, and if you had, you know, like me, I'm the youngest of five, you would stretch it as far as the cord attached to the phone would stretch. You would set it down, and you would, right, that's how it worked. I mean, that's, that's how you used a phone in that day, and it uh, seemed super reliable. Did anybody ever have a party line? Now, a party line growing up, let me tell you what that was. That wasn't like, hey, we're going to merge calls on purpose. It's not like we're going to just, hey, I'm talking to my one friend and another friend's calling. Let me merge these and we'll all gossip. I mean, talk about whatever's important. This is how it went. We shared a party line with somebody down the street, and uh, she happened to be a widow, and I'm sure she was kind, but I was a teenager, and I could hear her breathing, and I'm like, Miss Lyons, hang up the phone. And then get, her breathing would get quieter. And then you would hear this, like, precision. Click. <laughs> yeah, good days. But you know what? The whole time I was growing up, we moved our phone from one house to the other. That phone lasted until my mom sold the farm. I mean, for like... And, and that phone really predated me. You, you didn't just get the new model because somebody like Alexander Graham Bell was coming up with new things all the time. Because, see, this was the thing, and it was going to last for a long time. So today, what I'd like to talk about is what Jesus intends to last for eternity. Made to last hope. Made to last hope. See, the, the Jesus that I know and the hope that he offers is made to last. It's not made to expire. It's not made to run out. It's not made to be temporary. It's not made to be based on your feelings. It's not meant to be based on, on what you're going through. It's made to last. And I think we, we probably all could use more hope, couldn't we? I, I don't know that we need more stuff, but I know one thing. We need more hope. When people ask me how I'm doing, I'll say this, uh, better than I deserve, not as good as I'd like to be. It's the curse of North America. It's not because I lack things, right, that I'm not, that I'm better than I deserve. 
It's because I have an abundance of things that I'm better than I deserve. It's not because I'm not as good as I'd like to be because of a lack of things, but it's a perception for many of us that we don't have enough of something, right? And most of the time, we base that on things that are like this, or things that fit in here, or things that come with keys, and things that are certainly temporary. But the hope that Jesus offers is made to last because it's made to be something that has longevity outside of the cycle of our normative experience. The hope of Jesus is made to last because it's intended to have longevity outside of the circle of our normative experience. So I want to start with a, a verse today that I hope to end with. It's, it's found in Romans chapter 15. And uh, Romans chapter 15 is, is an interesting verse. But then we're going to go backwards in Romans. Romans, by the way, is one of the, the most beautiful and most confusing books in the entire New Testament. It, it, it's known as Paul's gospel book. His other letters are written to churches. His other letters are based on uh, often dealing with, with divisions in the church. It's all, his other letters are instructional to specific groups of people at specific times. But the book of Romans, it's an overview. It's a, it really is Paul's explanation of the gospel in a Roman context in a, in a debate form where he poses a question, answers a question, poses a harder question, answers the harder question. Does that make sense? So if you just cherry pick a few verses out of Romans, you'll have really bad theology. Theology, what you believe to be true about God. If you cherry pick a few things out of Romans, it's really dangerous for your theologic congruence, your systematic theology and how you, how you do life with God. Does that make sense? So when we get to, to verse 13 of Romans 15, this is what Paul does. He's, he, it's a prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Now, I, I think we could all agree that we would like to, to omit five letters that make up two words, as you. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. See, what, what we often want is we want the hope of God without the requirement of the trust of God. Does that make sense? We, we live in a time where what we really desire are all the benefits without any of the inconvenience. We, we want all the, all the good without any of the equity on our behalf. Paul doesn't sell this cheap. He makes it clear. The hope of God is based on the character of God that never changes. It's always constant. It's always available. It never moves. It's made to last. The hope of God is made to last. The byproduct of the hope of God is that we can be filled with joy and peace. The word peace in, in Greek, uh, it, it can... When it's applied to a nation, it means tranquility. When it's applied to relationships, it means, it means unity and bonding, peace. May you be filled with that as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Trust unlocks, unlocks the storehouse of God's hope into our life, but you can't have hope without it, at least not in the promises of the the Bible. Pastor, it was Easter last week. Why are you coming back with this hard sledgehammer? Because I don't want to ever stand before God having preached a partial truth. Paul also writes, am I now trying to please men or God? If I were still trying to please men, then I wouldn't please God. So I just want to tell you the truth. And by the way, everything I'm going to tell you, I've ripped off. It's all from this book. So 
so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's how we do it. There's this great hope. There's this incredible hope. It's based on the character of, of who God is. And this God of hope can fill you. I pray that the God of hope will fill you with joy and peace as you trust, as you place your confidence in, as you pin your faith to his truth, not your circumstances, not your feelings, not your fluctuations of bipolarity that we call North American culture. So let's back this up to Romans chapter 4. I like what Claire Booth Luce had to say, there are no hopeless situations, only people who have grown hopeless about them. When I think of Abraham, which we're going to dive into, to, we're going to break into Abraham's story just a bit. You guys know who Abraham is, right? Abraham, if you go back to Genesis, God called Abraham to leave his homeland. God called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans, where he was from. God called Abraham to to go and follow after God, and so Abraham began to do that. He came out of a pagan culture. He was part of a fertility cult. I mean, so many things were wrong in Abraham's life, and yet God chose Abraham to, to follow him, and God can, said, listen, Abraham, I, I want to enter a covenant, and you can read all about it in, the, in, in Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and now you'll read about Abraham all throughout the rest of the Bible after he's introduced. This is what's interesting. Verse 18, against all hope, against all the odds, it didn't make any sense, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. God said, Abraham, listen, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your, your, your offspring so numerous, nobody's going to be able to count them. It's going to be crazy what I'll do. Your assignment, Abraham, is to trust in me. I'm going to enter a covenant with you, and I am going to be based on my character. I promise you, Abraham, I will be faithful to the covenant. Now, what we get to know about Abraham is he was imperfect. If you want to go back and look at the character attributes of people in their journey, see, here's what I believe. We all have a starting point in our relationship with Jesus, and it doesn't end with some little prayer. A powerful prayer begins a journey where God walks with us, and because he loves us, he doesn't let us off the hook when he needs to help us grow. So when we mess up, it's not just like, oops, sorry, high five, okay, let's keep going. Nope, hey, eh, let's back that up. Let's come right back to this place, right? Against all hope, it made no sense. In no sense, in all hope, did Abraham believe. And he became the father. Because what? He believed. He, his circumstances were hard. We'll read about them. Verse 19, without weakening his faith, that's really important. Why could Abraham believe? Because at the end, after he'd messed up, after he had told half-truths, which became whole lies, right, because he was scared. You really should go back and just read about Abraham. I think you'll like it. If you have questions about it and you take it seriously, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Cool? By the way, when I become so busy that I can't be accessible for people who are really wanting to grow by reading the Bible, then you probably should replace me. Amen, Pastor, good word. Back to this. Okay. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. I love how Paul writes that. I mean, Abraham was clueless, but he didn't give up hope. I mean, he faced the reality that he was already 100, and that means, you know, he's like, he's a near dead. Right? He's a ghost driver. He, his body's shrunk. Now he looks between the, the dashboard and the steering wheel. Anyway, back to this. I'll be one one day. He was about 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. I mean, that's just bold to make that statement. 
Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded. Will you say persuaded? That God had power to do what he had promised. What would it be like in our life if we were fully persuaded? See, I think part of the problem is we're partially persuaded. It's so easy to want to, to have the benefits of fully persuaded while we're living partially persuaded. And that's what we so often see happening in our faith is we want this, the full persuasion blessing with a partial persuasion commitment. You don't get to bank on the hope of God with partial persuasion. I'm fired up like Mentos in a Diet Coke bottle. <laughs> this is good. The Bible is teaching us something good, but it's hard. But it's good. Abraham would not have cashed in on the promises of God if he lived in partial obedience, partial faith, partial trust, partial persuasion. It required him being fully persuaded that God is worth trusting. And so if God is worth trusting, then, then God is, is to be obeyed in faith. So it requires faith to have trust, and it requires trust to have obedience. He's fully persuaded. Couldn't talk him out of it. His, his mistakes and his, his mess-ups and, and all the mess didn't talk him out of it. He was fully persuaded. I want to live a fully persuaded life of faith. I want to experience a fully persuaded life of faith. I, I want to believe that the promises of God can be trusted even when life is hard. That's where hope comes from. Verse 22, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. This is why we read in Genesis, we read in Romans, we read in Hebrews that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. There was a deposit of favor in Abraham's life because of his belief and his faith. It wasn't because of his feelings. It was because of his faith. And if we allow our faith to be the filter, then our feelings don't make our decisions. If we allow our feelings to be the filter, then, then our faith doesn't make the decisions, right? So why was Abraham called this giant of the faith? Why do we read about him in Hebrews 11? Why is so much emphasis given to Abraham? And by the way, every division in the Middle East comes back to Abraham. This, this whole truth about Abram, who became Abraham, and Sarai, who became Sarah, right? The huh of Hebrew. It's a real guttural language. I love it. You spit all over everybody represents the breath of God, the Theo, God, Neustos, breath. When he entered covenant, he changed their name because he gives you a new. Here's the thing. When you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have a living faith, you have a new identity. Who you were is no longer and who you've become is primary. That's why we celebrate baptism. It's not some check mark we make in our faith. It's a testimony of the whole world that this is who I am in Jesus Christ. Who you used to know isn't who you know now because I, I might look the same on the outside, but on the inside I'm brand new. Is credited to him as righteousness. Verse 23, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Look, what God said about Abraham wasn't a one-off opportunity. It's not for one guy only. It's not just one guy who gets his reality that God is really worth trusting. It can be for every one of us. 
See, it was credited to Abraham. It can be credited to you. That's what Paul's saying. That's really everybody. <laughs> Corey's acting like it's Girl Scout cookie time. I like it. <laughs> I still hold that there's nothing thin about the mint. It's false advertising. Anyway, back to this. It can be credited to us. So what does it require for it to be credited to us? That we believe in God. That we believe in God. That we trust in God. Not my circumstances. Not my feelings. That, that, the, that I believe, if I want it to be credited to me as righteous, if I want to stand before the God of the universe, which by the way, I believe there is a God of the universe. If I want to go to heaven and, and be acceptable in his sight, which I believe there is a heaven. And if I want to not go to hell, which I believe there is a hell, the Bible, you have to white out a lot of things for there not to be one. So if I want to be like Abraham in that God would credit me righteous, in right standing with God, then it requires my belief that leads to my trust, that formulates my faith, that is producing obedience in my life, that is all pinned on the immutable character of the God of hope. For those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, made just in the sight of God so that we can be in right relationship with God. And then I like how he, he jumps down to, to chapter 5. Therefore, would you say therefore really loud? See, this is where it gets really good. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So how do we get to this place that we have profound hope? What does it take to be people of convinced hope, fully persuaded faith based on hope? How do we get there? I don't think you'll ever have the hope of God operating in the, in the depth of your life without a surrendered motive, without a surrendered heart, and without a surrendered life. I don't, man, listen, church, I told you about 18 months ago I'm going to preach every sermon like it's going to be my last. If the weather ever gets good, I do ride a motorcycle. I sort of like it when my floorboards make sparks in a curve. It's not my goal to arrive safely at my point of death. It's not my goal to rush the expiration date. But I'm not living in some way to try to hang on to what's temporary. This mostly only makes Melissa nervous when I talk like this. Here's why I'm telling you this. Because the more I read, and I'm reading the Bible more this year than I've ever read it before in my life. I'm probably 15 to 18 chapters a day. 
And it is, it is sobering to me. And I'm not just reading it to make check marks. The Lord challenged me after my, you guys remember my Bible got stolen about a year ago? And I was crying about it, you know. Um, all my notes, you know, it had been bound several times. It's the one I got when I came to Christ and all that. And I think God did me a favor. Now, I don't know if the person is ever, whoever took it, I don't know what the story gets to be. I mean, it's an English Bible, and I was in a Spanish country, so there you have it. But, but the Lord challenged me to replace my, my underlines. And, and so I, have, I can't get enough. It's not like I'm some, you guys pay me to be a Christian, so realize, me reading, the, this, this shouldn't impress you, okay, I, I'm aware this shouldn't be impressing to you, but I'm not reading it for my job, I'm reading it for my life, so why am I preaching about hope in a way that puts it, the onus on you as individuals, because that's what the Bible teaches, See, the hope that Jesus offers isn't cheap. The road that he requires is really less traveled. The gate that you go through is narrow. He says it over and over again. There are about three times more warning verses in the Bible than blessing verses in the Bible. So if all we want to do in church is talk about all the good stuff, which we should talk about all the good stuff because hope is really good, but we have to talk about it in the context of honesty that it comes with, with an engaged faith. The hope Jesus offers requires your engaged faith, not your autopilot feelings. So what would it look like if a church was fully persuaded that the hope is worth hoping in and that we were going to live with, with abandonment to the flesh so that we could be fully alive in the spirit that gives us hope? I think that's when revival starts to come to zip codes. I think that's when revival begins to break out in high schools. I think that's when university campuses start to experience what we used to experience in the great revivals that form this nation. It doesn't happen by partially persuaded new take on Jesus marketing. Hope Jesus offers isn't easy. Sure is worth it. I told you I'd end with the same verse I started with. So Romans 15:13. Which, by the way, there's a lot left in Romans. There's a lot. You know what we like a lot? We like Romans 8, 28. For all things work together for the good of those who love God, like a candy bar. <laughs> the love there is all in. Everything in. It's I have decided to follow Jesus. In. Good word, Pastor. Man, Easter was great. <laughs> Today, interesting. I know, I can't help it. May the God of hope fill you with all. Would you say the word all? Joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know why Paul writes that? Because hope is one of the kindest things we could ever give to others. Hope is the, the, missing, the missing beauty that so often surrounds those that we love. They're missing hope. So we can't give what we don't have. And, and if it's overflowing, then we can't help it but to give it away. Because see, it's just going to be there and it's spilling out. Part of the problem is the partially persuaded only have partial hope so they have nothing to share. Anyway, um, I was reflecting on the sermon for this week, and Bailey, if you're in the, here, maybe you can come up. And I, how many of you even own a hymnal, or do you guys even remember hymnals? 
I, I didn't really grow up in a in an evangelistic church, and I called them hymnals. See, I I didn't. I, it took me a while to catch up with phonics. <laughs> What's a hymnal? We used to use this for all the things that weren't good, like pass it down. You know, we play that in the back, and then chuck each other on the head, and got in a lot of trouble with these hymnals. <laughs> when I went to college, we used to have we used to have a service once in a while where you'd call out a hymn number, right? I would, with regularity, wait toward the end. I'd call out number 503, and nobody knew what it was until, like, my third semester. And then they caught on. It's O Canada. It was in the hymnal. <laughs> and then the person on the stage would be like, uh, we'll just sing one verse of that. <laughs> Oh, Canada. Anyway, it's about all I remember of it. That's right. Thank you, Rich. But I was reading last night, as I often do, I've got a few hymnals at home and a few in my office. I think there's great depth in the words that were made to last. I, I really appreciate the worship atmosphere of this church. I appreciate the the time and the energy, the talent and the effort that that goes into everything we do here. And we have a we have a fabulous team of people down that hallway, on this platform, all over the building that make the church what it is. But I have a I have a soft place in my heart for, for some hymns. And so we're going to sing this one as we close today. The title's The Solid Rock, and it, it was written by Edward Mote. He lived in the early 1800s. He, he became a, a pastor as a, as a change of career. God called him out of what he was doing and called him into something completely different. And by the way, I think God still calls people to ministry. I think God still calls people to pastoral ministry. If you ever feel like God may be calling you to ministry, I'd love to, to make time and have coffee with you because, see, I think God, God is, his, the eyes of the Lord are still searching to and fro throughout the earth to find those whose hearts are completely his, and he calls out many to be, to be in ministry. That was Edward Mote, the writer's story. Verse 1, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, just like he made with Abraham. We serve a God of covenant. And covenant language is, if you, I will. If you, I will. It's legal, in a sense, language. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When everything around me circumstantially is falling apart, when life seems like it's all uphill and there's no end in sight, when it feels like to go to work in the morning, I load a wheelbarrow full of, of gravel and I push it up a staircase. When my relationships seem like they're falling apart, when there's more month at the end of the money because I had a diagnosis and my insurance didn't pay the a lot of the part when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay I don't think he I don't think Pastor Moat wrote that whimsically easily and then verse 4 when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. You know why? Because not to be found in him in covenant, not to be trusting, not to be living out your faith, 
would be really tragic for the time when Christ returns or the time that you go to meet him. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I think you're here today because you want to have a fully persuaded relationship with Jesus Christ. Or you're here because somebody annoyed you enough that you said yes and you'd come. Either way, I'm just glad you're here. But here's the, here's the question that I have for you today before we sing this great hymn of the church. Are you fully persuaded? Because if you're fully persuaded, then you have reason for great hope. Are you partially persuaded? Partially persuaded sounds like this. God is love. Fully persuaded is this. God is love and he's just. Partially persuaded is God is love and, it, and because he's love, he's just going to give in. Fully persuaded is God is love and because he's love, that love came with a price. It, it required his own death and, it, and the power of the resurrection. And, and in that love, he has guardrails that require me to live in obedient faith. That's fully persuaded. Here's what I'd ask you, church. Are you tired of negotiating with God in order to have hope? You can't read Hebrews 12, or Hebrews 11, I'm sorry. The faith chapter, without realizing hope is the requirement for obedience. Hope is the requirement. And you can't have hope on partially persuaded faith. I invite you, I believe the Lord invites you to go all in and be fully persuaded. doesn't mean you have to know everything about, about theology. It just means whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do that is not in conflict with the Word of God and the Spirit of truth, that God is reconciling the world to Himself and to each other, that, that you can live a fully persuaded life because the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to know right from wrong, good from bad, hope from hell. I just don't want to be a part of leading people to believe that partially persuaded is God's high watermark of faith. Wouldn't it be awesome if this church, this refinery, you know, we only, the things that get refined in life are only things of high value. You don't build manufacturing plants to extrapolate and refine things that really are worthless. Wouldn't it be awesome if the refinery became known as a church that just is fully persuaded and they're going to love God in such a way that serving people, this overflow of love leads to this, wherever the, the, the people of the church happen to be, other people's lives are, 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 are loved and they're cared for. Amen. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could give up the idea that we have to be perfect, but we just need to be more persuaded? See, we, we want to get it all right, but Jesus just wants us to go all in. Abraham didn't get it all right. He just went all in. And the more all in he went over and over again, the more he got it all right. Man, I'm, I don't know that I'm doing a great job, but I'm just telling you, I'm so fired up. Because Easter should not just be a day for great pictures. It should be the exclamation point that leads to total persuasion that we become fully persuaded that nothing can stand in the way of the love of God and nothing can take us from the love of God and the love of God is loving and kind and it's just and strong and in it we have great hope if we're fully persuaded. Amen. Father, thank you. Man, don't ever, God, let us get over loving you and being saved by your grace. 
Father, I pray that you would, you would forgive me for the times in my life when I act out of partial persuasion instead of fully persuaded hope. Lord, I pray that those who come behind us in this church would find us faithful because they find us fully persuaded. Lord, I pray our children would find us fully persuaded. I pray the next generation of leaders would, would, would be able to look at us and go, man, they, 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 they were fully persuaded. And they became more fully persuaded and more fully persuaded and less feelings-oriented and less circumstance-driven. They just wanted to be fully persuaded to follow after God because of that's where their hope comes from. So Lord, I pray as we sing this song, you would do your work in our, in our spirits. Here's what I'd ask you with nobody looking around. How many of you would say, you know, the truth is today, I, I have not engaged a fully persuaded faith and I want to drive a stake in the ground today and say I'm, I'm all in I want to be fully persuaded would you just lift your hands amen praise God praise God if that's for you today and you lifted your hand you can pray at your seat you can pray at the altar or you can just make a declaration today Jesus I'm all in I'm fully persuaded I believe all the truth about you, that you're the Son of God, that you gave your life for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm repentant from that. I'm not going to continue to live that way. And I want to I want to be all in in full persuasion and sing this, this old hymn of the church as a declaration of your new persuaded faith. Amen? Amen. Let's sing that together, church.